الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونسبحه ونقدسه على آلائه ونعمائه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إلها واحدا أحدا فردا صمدا حيا قيوما نؤمن له بالربوبية ونقر له بالعبودية من يهدي الله فهو المهتدي ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين والشهداء والصالحين وعترة نبيك الطاهرين عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل قال الله في كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما آتيتم من ربا ليربو في أموال الناس فلا يربو عند الله وما آتيتم من زكاة تريدون وجه الله فأولئك هم المضعفون صدق الله العلي العظيم وصلوا على محمد وآل محمد What should our ideal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look like? There's a, a famous hadith Qudsi, a narration that I'd like to share with you. And it says the following. It says, La zala abdi yataqarrabu ilayya bin nawafil hatta uhibbah. That my servant, God says, continues to grow and continues to come closer to me, to gain proximity through the supererogatory prayers, the extra prayers, meaning going beyond just the minimum level, the basic level. And as he does that, my love for him or her increases. And what happens when God's love for us increases, it says that the hadith says that I become the ears by which he hears and the eyes by which he sees and the tongue by which he speaks and the heart by which he understands. And so the, the, in essence, the closer that, that we become, the more we are transformed and we begin to perceive and behave on a higher level. There's a narration it says that تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ That take on godly attributes. So in essence, the, the more that we gain in our proximity to God, we do not become gods, but we become godly in our mannerisms and our behavior. I bring that up because I was um, reading uh, something recently and uh, there, there was a book written a few decades ago by a psychiatrist, Eric Byrne. He wrote a book called Games People Play. And it's about social function and dysfunction and the type of behaviors that we take on. And he says that essentially when it comes to our ego, right? So part of our persona is our ego. There are different levels and different aspects to our ego. Level one is referred to as the child ego state. So if you've seen the way a child behaves, they kick and they scream and they pout in order to get something. And the theory is that as, as a human being, even though you grow in age, you still have that child within you, which is part of your ego. And that's why you see people who are not children in terms of age, they're older, right? 20, 30, 40, 50, but they still act like children. When they do that, it's because of that child ego state. The second level is the parent ego state. Not the adult, but the parent. And what that refers to is the fact that uh, part of our ego reflects the way that we were raised by our parents 
and the way that we witnessed their reactions. So sometimes it becomes a default where you react to something, uh, you know, a, a relationship challenge or a financial challenge or a social challenge in the same way that your father did or the same way that your mother did. And so people say things like, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree because people behave in that way, in that manner from the parent's ego state. And the third, he refers to as the adult's ego state. That is when we reach a certain level of maturity, that we begin to behave like responsible adults. And so he says that the goal in your own behavior is to not act out of the child ego state, nor out of the parent ego state, but rather out of the adult ego state. So there was a religious writer that was writing about this and he said, well, there can be a fourth level. There could be the God ego state to where you become so close to God that you begin to behave in a situation the way God would behave in a certain situation in terms of your compassion and in terms of your mercy, in terms of your generosity. So I find that very interesting because <laughs> The hadith says that the, the closer you become to God, the more that God becomes the ear that you hear from, the eye that you see from, the tongue that you speak from, and the heart that you understand from, in a similar fashion. And I say that because when it, when it comes to our rituals, when it comes to our uh, acts of worship, when it comes to our prayer, we need to constantly ask ourselves, what is the purpose behind this? Many people, the reason why, why their prayers are not answered is because they remain in a transactional mode. Meaning that I want this, when I want it, how I want it, in the way that I want it. And so the whole time when they're praying for something, that's their mindset and that's their approach. Instead of approaching God not by, trans by, way of trans uh, by way of transaction, but by way of transformation. And that's what I want to talk about, transaction and transformation. Meaning gaining proximity to God so that He can transform you. Not give you, but transform you and make you a better person. Because once you transform, naturally, you're going to arrive at the destination that you're looking at. You know, there's, there's a... There's an interesting story in the Qur'an. It's the story of the Battle of Hunayn. And the Battle of Hunayn is, it's mentioned in the Qur'an by name. It's one of the few battles that's mentioned by name in chapter number 9. وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنٍ إِذْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ كَثْرَتُكُمْ God says that remember on the day of Hunayn where you were impressed by your numbers. So basically just to put it in a nutshell, the Muslims had along with, with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had left Medina, the vast majority of them were, um, were of the Ansar, of the emigrants, the, the people, uh, of the um, uh, supporters, the people that received the Prophet. And so when they went to Mecca in order to conquer it, they were about 10,000 strong. Now, this is much different than their first battle, the Battle of Badr, when they were only about 313. So for them, they had numbers on their side. They go into Mecca, they conquer it, and they're about to leave and go back to Medina, but there's a diversion. And the, the tribe of Hawazin and the tribe of Thaqif, who were in an area known as a Ta'if, if, if you've been to the Arabian Peninsula around Mecca, you would know where Ta'if is. It's just outside of Mecca. From before, from the pre-Islamic days, they were already not on good terms with the community in Mecca. So when they found that the Meccan forces, there's, they're 10,000 strong, plus another 2,000, they began to mobilize their army. Now what tends to happen when you achieve a victory in your life, psychologically, is very interesting. Biologically is very interesting. They say that the part of your brain that is responsible for more motivation and reward, you see an increase uh, in, in, in the receptors there. And so that explains how a team is able to go on a winning streak, a sports team, because of their confidence. 
because as they secure small victories, something biological happens where there's now more testosterone delivered and all of a sudden, you, you know, you're, 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 you're moving from one victory to another victory seamlessly. So the Muslims had just conquered Mecca. Think about this. This monster that they were afraid of for about a decade, and this is towards the end of the life of the Prophet. So after a decade of, bu uh, of being bullied by this big army, this community, finally they get to take over. Now when they take over, they bring with them another 2,000 people. So they're 12,000 and they go up against an army of about 20,000 people. They didn't know what was waiting for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in chapter number 9, He reminds them of this. وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنٍ إِذْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ كَثْرَتُكُمْ that Don't forget about that day, the day of Hunayn, where you read your own press clippings and you were impressed with your numbers. You thought that because you had succeeded and you were victorious one time, that automatically you were going to be granted another victory and another success. And they were almost defeated had it not been for that core group that surrounded themselves around the Prophet, led by none other than Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib Now, Muslims win the battle, but what unfolds is really interesting. Because what the, Hawazin, the tribes of Hawazin and Thaqif, what they did, which was not conventional, but they did this in order to boost their own probabilities of winning and their confidence is they didn't just bring out the army of men. They brought with them the women and children and cattle. Everyone left town. And they placed the women and the children in the back as a motivator for the men on the front line of the battle. But with that, they lost. And so the women and children were considered prisoners of war along with the, the prisoners that they had taken. And all of the cattle that they had brought out, everything that they had brought out, were considered spoils of war. So the Prophet sent back the prisoners of war, and he began to divide some of the spoils of war amongst his companions. Now, the group of companions was very diverse, because you had one group of people who were the Muhajireen, that migrated with the Prophet from Mecca to Medina. They were loyal. They left behind everything they knew in Mecca, and then they left behind everything they knew in, knew in Medina to go out with the Prophet again. You had the group of the Ansar who were there in Medina, who again, they received the Prophet, they helped the Prophet establish the community, they left their community to go to Mecca for the conquest. And then you had a third group of people. These were the people who their belief was not cemented yet. People that had joined Islam or not Islam, the ranks of the Muslims after the conquest of Mecca. People like Abu Sufyan and his sons. People like Safwan, Suhail ibn Amr. People that the Quran refers to as Al-Mu'allafati Qulubuhum. Those that need their hearts to be reconciled. Meaning that their belief was not fully cemented yet. What does the Prophet do? He, he begins to distribute the spoils of war. And for the people that came with him, for the Ansar, he gives them three, four camels, sheep. But when it comes to people like Abu Sufyan and Suhail ibn Amr, he gives them a hundred. He gives them two hundred. He gives them three hundred. So think about what's going on in the minds of the believers at that time. They're thinking, what's going on? We've, we've left our families. We've put ourselves in danger. We almost lost this battle. And now the Prophet is only giving us this much. So one of the Ansar came to the Prophet. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, emotions are running high. People are confused. We want to figure out what's going on. And at this time, the Prophet turned to them. And the one that came to the Prophet was Sa'd ibn Ubadah, who was a, a, a prominent companion. And so he turns to them. He says, look, he gathers them, the people that, that were sort of affected by this emotionally. He said, he said, wasn't it that you were in error and God brought me to guide you? 
Was it not that you were in a state of poverty and through me God enriched you? Was it not that you were enemies of one another and through me God created reconciliation between your hearts? So he begins to remind them of all of the favors that God bestowed upon them through him. And at that moment, the narration says that, you know, they were, they were bawling in tears because they, they thought about the blessings of God in their life that came by way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they couldn't say anything. So then the Prophet continued. He said, aren't you going to reply to what I said? They looked to him, they said, Ya Rasulullah, how are we supposed to reply? I mean, you, 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 you gave us the proof, you said everything. He said, well, you can also reply and say the same thing to me. That, O Prophet of God, were you not discredited and we gave you credit? Were you not running away from your people and we gave you shelter and we gave you protection? Were you not forlorn and we helped you? And this was, this was part of the love and compassion that Rasulullah had. He, he didn't want, even though, that, even though he was the prophet and he was the messenger, he didn't want to make it seem that it was only him that was doing them a favor. He wanted to show them love and importance. Out of his compassion, he reminded them of the favors that they had also bestowed upon him as well. Such a tender and loving heart. You know, there was a, a psychologist by the name of Eric Fromm, and he talked about the different levels of love there are. So the first level is... Uh, I love you because I want you. And the second is I love you because I need you. But the third and highest level is I love you because you need me. Those first two levels, I want you and I need you, you become very selective because if you don't want someone and if you don't need them, there's no reason to love them. But the third level is I love you because you need me. That's exactly what the Prophet was showing there. So, so going back to that whole idea of transaction versus transformation, the Qur'an is showing us that for some people, their level of faith is so low at the moment that everything they do, whether it's their prayers, whether it's their fasting, it's a transactional thing. What can I get out of this? If I pray one unit, if I offer one unit of prayer, what's God going to give me in return? If I offer one unit of charity, what's God going to give me in return? Versus becoming someone who is transformational. So when you pray, there's, there's a beautiful example out there. Some people think that, you know, I'm going to pray, it's like I'm going fishing. I'm going to throw out, you know, the, 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 the line, and then I'm going to hook something and, and it's going to come back to me. But in reality, a powerful prayer is not throwing out the line and expecting to get a fish. A powerful prayer is throwing out the anchor and expecting to come closer to the land. When you throw out the anchor, you gain proximity to the land, to the shore. But it's not the shore and the land that's coming to you. You are going to it. So when you're praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking for a thing, it shouldn't be with the mindset of what can I get out of it, but rather it should be the mindset of who I can become through it. Who am I becoming through this? There's a, a story that, that, that uh, a colleague shared very recently, and this colleague works at a hospital here in Orange County. And she said that she came across a patient that had technically done all the right things in their life. You know, they, had, they were eating right, they were eating organic, they never smoked, they exercised on a regular basis. They did all of the right things, but then they were struck with cancer. And so the idea was why? You know, that, that, that was the question. And it's, it's normal to ask why, you know, why me or why is this happening to me? There's nothing wrong with asking the question, but the discussion that came of that is the idea of transaction versus transformation. What am I doing all of the right things for in my life? Am I doing it just so I can get something back as a transaction? Or am I engaging that kind of behavior as a way for me to transform and become a better person? Because the reality about life is it's not what you get out of life, it's who you become through your life. So to be is better than to do. You know, all of us, we think about in the morning or the night before, we, th we think about our to-do list. But we should start thinking about our to-be list. Who is the person that I want to be? 
not what do I want to do or what do I want to say. They say one day um, that, that, that Gandhi, this eccentric little man who was able to bring together 200 million people in harmony, and that's an impressive feat because if you've ever worked in leadership, try bringing two people together in harmony. Well, he brought 200 million together and created a movement. One day, uh, they, they say that he would once a month take a vow of silence. He wouldn't speak. He would not say anything. So during one of those days when he had taken a vow of silence, a British reporter ran up to him. He saw him, he caught him at the train station departing from one place to another. And he said, give me one message that I can take back to my people. Say something that I can take back to my people. And so he had taken a vow of silence. So he took out a paper and a pen. He scribbled a little bit on it and he threw it to him. And when the reporter read it, it said, my life is the message. My life is the message. It's not what I say. So again, going back to that whole idea of transaction versus transformation. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, and I read the verse in, in the beginning of the lecture, but it's chapter number 30, verse 39. فَلَا يَرْبُوا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَمَا آتَيْتُمْ مِنْ زَكَاتٍ تُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُضْعِفُونَ That when you give, there's two types of giving that are, that's discussed in this verse. One is for usury, riba. Now the word in the Arabic language, riba, literally means to grow something. Something that grows. That's why you refer to a coach as a murabbi. To, 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 to grow something. Someone who helps in your growth process. But here, in this context, it's used to describe usury. Whenever someone is taking, being taken advantage financially, and part of that is interest, the interest which is not allowed. So I give someone $100 with the expectation that they're going to give me back $150, right? Even though the verse is saying, and that's a transaction right there, you're doing it transactionally, you're hoping to get something, you're giving with the hope of getting something more in return, he says that it does not grow in the eyes of God. Not that you're not going to get, you may get back the 150, but in the eyes of God, there's no growth there. There's no real growth happening. There's no barakah, there's no blessings in that. And then the second, min zakat. Whatever you give, which is zakat, charity, you're giving it for the sake of God. Turiduna wajhallah. That that is truly what is multiplied. Mudaif means to multiply something. That is truly what is multiplied in the eyes of God. So one form of giving is transactional. The other form is transformational. So God is saying when you do something with the intention of transformation, not with the intention of transaction, that's when you grow in His eyes. And that's when you truly grow on the inside. So that's a question that we need to ask ourselves. Is that in my day-to-day -day behaviors, in my relationships, with my family, with my community, in my prayer to God, is it what can I get, when can I get it in the fashion that I want? Or is your intention, oh Allah, bring me closer to you. And the closer that I become to you, the more you become my eyes through which I see and the ears by which I hear and the tongue by which I speak and the heart by which I understand so that I can become a blessing to people rather than a burden upon people. There was a young man who played for um, Alabama Crimson Tide. I don't know if there are any football fans, college football fans in here. But he was coached by Nick Saban who is arguably one of the best football coaches out there. And he says that the, the advice that he would give us is that when you go to bed every night, usually you pray for something. When you go to bed, don't just pray for blessings. Pray to be a blessing. Pray that you're going to be a blessing in somebody's life. So not just transaction, but transformation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us His love so that it can transform us into better beings. We ask Allah to, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our deeds in this holy month. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ 
وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر وصلوا على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين والشهداء والصالحين وعترة نبيك الطاهرين علي أمير المؤمنين وقائد الغر المحجلين وعلى البضعة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وعلى سبط نبي الرحمة وسيد شباب أهل الجنة الحسن والحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي عجر الله تعالى فرجه وسهل مخرجه وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل Narrated in Bihar al-Anwar from our sixth Imam Al-Imam Ja'far bin Muhammad al-Sadiq alayhi salam He says that Jibra'il came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said the following he said, Ya Muhammad, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. He said to him three things. He says, Ya Muhammad, Ish ma shi'ta fa inna ka mayyit. Wa ahbib man shi'ta fa inna ka mufariqa. Wa amal ma shi'ta fa inna ka mulaqih. That Ya Rasulullah, live as much as you want for eventually you will die. Live as much as you want. Live life to the fullest, for eventually, even if you do, there's an end to that. And number two, love whoever you want to love, for eventually you will part ways with that person. No matter how much you love someone, they're not gonna be there in the grave with you. And when the, the time comes for it in the Akhirah, in fact, they're going to be parting ways with you before you can think of parting ways with them. One parting from one another. And the third, Do whatever you want, for eventually you are going to come together with that thing again. You are going to meet it. Mulaqat is to meet. Whatever you put out there in the world, you're going to meet it again. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes all of our actions. Not a single grain on this earth. Not anything that is dry or wet, meaning that on land or in the sea, except that it is recorded in a very clear and detailed book. And whatever we choose to do in the dark, whatever grows in the dark gets exposed in the light. And this is a very powerful hadith because it, it teaches us the law of natural consequence which is common sense but common sense is not common practice. We tend to forget that whatever you live, it's not going to come with you. Whoever you love, they're not going to join you. But whatever you do, you are going to meet it. So don't just focus on, you know, they say live life to the fullest. You only live once. Or love whoever you want to love and be who, don't just focus on that. Focus on what you are going to, to come with, which is everything that you do. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us uh, purification of our character and purification of our intentions. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah ya'mur bil adli wal ihsani wa ita'i dal qurba wa yanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar wal baghi ya'adukum la'allakum tadakkaroon. Two quick announcements. Tomorrow uh, we have a youth bonfire in Huntington Beach. We sent out the flyer today in the email from 4 to 8 p.m. And next Saturday, November 9th, uh, is the celebration of the birth of our Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
beginning here at 6.30 p.m. with prayers, and then the main program at 7 p.m. As you know, every year we uh, use this occasion to bring together the interfaith and intrafaith community. So we have some interfaith and intrafaith guests coming in. Inshallah, bring your families. It will be a very joyous occasion. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this blessed day, the day of Friday, to bring relief to all of the believers worldwide who are in need. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, to allow this day to be a day of blessing for them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring relief to the hearts of all of those who are oppressed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma khfil al-mu'minin wal-mu'minat wal-muslimin wal-muslimat al-ahya'i minhum wal-amwat taba' baynana wa baynahum bil-khayrat innaka mujibu al-da'wat innaka qadu al-hajat innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir birahmatika ya arhamar rahimin wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli baytih al-tayyibin al-tahirin.